Hey, it's Adam Carolla. Hey, this is Kelty Knight from Lady Gang. Hey, it's Steve Offs from the Steve Offs Show. This is Heather Dubrow from Heather Dubrow's World. Hey, this is Rob Riggle. And Sarah Tiana from Riggle's Picks. This is Caitlin Bristow from Off the Vine on Podcast One. This Veterans Day, I'd like to give a special thanks to all those who've served in the armed forces. From the Army, the Navy, the Marine Corps, the Air Force, the Coast Guard, and the Reserves. Because of your bravery, we can live without fear. Because of your valor, we can soar into the bright future. Because of your sacrifice, we don't have to sacrifice the liberties that we hold so dear. We could not do it without you. Thank you again for your service, and all of us at Podcast One hope you enjoy a safe holiday weekend. Back to the Schmodown Rundown. What's going on, Schmodown fans? It is I, Frank Janish. Brad, Brad Gilmore is not with us. This, not with us this week. He could not make it, but that's okay because we are joined by friend of the show and the managing editor of TriviaSD.com and apparently my new boss. It is William the Beast Bibiani. Back to work, Frank Janish. Get back to work. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, how you doing, Bibbs? I'm okay. I was just supposed to do a guest spot, and then Brad, I guess, was was too good for this. So I gotta, I gotta bump up and uh, uh, take over his his job. So I'm going to uh, be mean to you, uh, okay. and uh, be right like half the time. So. Wow. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's more than he's right usually, but a little subtle. I'm being nice. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, but this week was an interesting week because in the singles tournament, and I'm using air quotes because is it really the tournament? Is it not really the tournament? It's up to you. But it is the gauntlet. It was three matches this week. We had a doubleheader on Tuesday and then the gauntlet final, if you will, on Friday. But before we get into the matches, there is a couple, uh, there are a couple news items we want to get to here, but, uh, and then we'll talk about the website with, with you, Bibbs, of course, but what a coincidence. Uh, yeah, how that happened. Uh, Christian, he posted about why the Patreon is important to the future of the Schmodown, and he posted that on the website. So if you haven't read that piece, uh, I highly encourage uh, all of you to go over to TriviaSD.com and find that piece that Christian wrote. It gives some explanation why uh, the Patreon is important and his plans with the Patreon. And and if there's any other questions you had about the Patreon, I suggest you go read that article. But speaking of the website now, uh, Bibbs, you are the managing editor. Uh, first question is, what does a managing editor actually do? Well, I edit and I manage. Uh, mm. No, on. okay, no, no, no. I, I've, I've, <laughs> I've, I've, I've done this job before. Uh, a managing editor has a lot of responsibilities uh, at a website. Basically, we're responsible for the content going out and for it to be of a consistent level of quality and to work with various writers and come up with various pitches and work with those pitches until there's something that we think people would really want to read. I help people uh, copy edit their work. If they need more in-depth work than that, I, I provide more hands-on editing and I talk to them about structure and uh, things that audiences expect or do not know that they need to expect or, uh, or that they want or don't know that they want yet. Um, I'm responsible for a lot of formatting decisions on the site. I help change the site so that it becomes more intuitive over time. That's something that's going to be adjust. Uh, you know, we just started. Um, and um, already people have, like, great ideas. Like, oh, why we should have this as a tab. And I'm like, oh, we should have that as a tab. So, boom, 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 boom. Now it's a tab. Um, so, yeah, it basically it's the nuts and bolts, the nitty-gritty of the site. I will be doing a little bit of writing for the site. I wrote an editorial for the site this week. Uh, but it's mostly just editing you guys and managing you. Mm-hmm. Wow. It's, it's pretty simple, huh? It, it, in theory, it is, but it requires a lot of these like little little skill sets, and in some sure. cases, not so little skill sets. Like just knowing how like something like you know the website that we use to arrange the site, like WordPress, knowing how that works, that requires you know quite a bit of 
time, just using it in different capacities, learning the little quirks, learning what makes, you know, an article look this way as opposed to that way, and sometimes it's not very intuitive, so that's very useful in that regard. But also just, you know, I, I've been writing about film for a really long time, and, you know, you develop the skills of an old-school J. Jonah Jameson type editor when it comes to just making something punchy, making it readable, making sure it's accurate. And of course, Frank, once again, bring me pictures of (laughs) Spider-Man. Yes. Um, I got a couple. I still got to develop them. I got to go back to the the closet and develop those. Uh, Now that the the website is up and running, though, um, what are, I don't know if you can speak to this. uh, What what do you envision the site uh, ultimately, you know, full vision, you know, we're a little bit, let's say we're into next season. Where, where do you think we could be from now until the start of the next season? Well, ultimately, the goal is for this to be the ultimate Schmodown hub. Not just the hub for the ultimate Schmodown, but ultimately everything you'd want from the Schmodown, you could get or access here, unless it's a Patreon exclusive, in which case we'd still link to it. But you just have to be a patron to access it. Uh, we want to ha- be a comprehensive, easy-to-navigate library of all previous Schmodown content, especially the matches, but everything else we as well. We want to uh, let all Schmodown bloggers who want to, we want to ha- let them come in and have their work read and disseminated together. Uh, and we have a lot of really cool people who've been writing about it from various parts of the internet, and we're going to just try to get their work in front of as wide an audience as possible and have them play off of each other. We have a point-counterpoint article we're doing really, really soon, which I think is a a fun way to get people working together who maybe wouldn't have otherwise. Um, But when it comes to the actual Schmodown content, we want this to be equal parts uh, fan interests, like theories and speculations and top ten lists or whatever, but also behind-the-scenes stuff. And we got interviews with people from throughout the Schmodown, in front of the scenes, behind the scenes. Uh, I've got guest uh, editorials from various members of the Schmodown, giving you an, an idea of their mindset and their preferences and their history in the game. Uh, so we're going to have a ton of stuff, and I we are always, because the Schmodown is for the fans, we wouldn't do it if you guys weren't interested and didn't watch and weren't passionate enough to justify making a website in the first place, we're always listening to ideas. So if there's something you want on the website that you're not seeing yet, well, it might be in the pipeline, but just in case it's not, make sure you let us know. Now, this is going to roll out over time. Uh, we have a whole bunch of ideas, and you know we don't want to flood the site with everything right away because we want to we want to spread it out. We want to give you a reason to come back at least every weekday. I want every day and hopefully more than once a day. Uh, but for now, we're building it up. We're getting it started. We're all getting our feet wet. Uh, we're figuring out the kinks just on the website itself. Um, and uh, yeah, it's only going to get better from here. But I think we started really, really strong. We had some really cool articles to begin with. Uh, Frank, you wrote a really great article that was just listing all of the major record holders in the Schmodown. This is the kind of information that I think a lot of people kind of forget uh, is is really, really important. A lot of people who are Schmodown fans have been fans for a really long time, and it's really useful to invite new people in and give them a primer. So one other thing we're going to do on the website is we're going to do some articles about the history of the Schmodown, and that includes something like we're, w- one article that's in the works right now would be a history of the very first match in the Schmodown, which I think a lot of people haven't watched. So we're going to give you that context. So we're going to talk about uh, the famous controversies, and uh, we want to just make everyone feel welcome and get everyone excited for every facet of this really awesome thing that we all love. Well, it sounds really great. I'm really proud to be a part of it and working alongside you, Bibbs. The emails that you send uh, give me great uh, inspiration, and uh, they're very uplifting and make me feel like uh, 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 that, that I can do a great job. So I want to thank you for that right off the bat. And uh, I look forward to seeing where the future of this site goes because I think it's going to be really, really great, especially... Uh, going into next season. And I look forward to seeing those pictures of Spider-Man. <laughs> I, you, you know what? There was actually, there's actually a guy uh, who dresses up as Spider-Man. He's down on, on State Street down here in downtown Chicago, and he was up on top of uh, a light post or a, a, a street sign and just overlooking people and just occasionally throughout the little web thing with web hands and mm-hmm. i should should have got a picture you didn't get a picture, a picture of spider-man i did it was right I saw, there <laughs> what were you thinking <laughs> i know and then i was later i was like damn i should have did i should have right? sent it to you had one there's job. a video out there somewhere there's you a video had out there one somewhere. job all right fine yeah yeah <laughs> all right moving on um 
but as a reminder to other patrons and people who have not yet joined uh, the Patreon, this month, you know, every month we have an exclusive exhibition match, and this month, for the month of November, we have movie release date exhibition match, and that is going to have it's a fatal four way between Adam Hlavik, Scott Mance, Ben Bateman, of course, and Sam Levine. Now, these four gentlemen are going to do battle about movie release dates. All movie release dates. A lot of fans have been wanting this type of match for quite some time, namely between Scott Mance and Ben Bateman. As we know, Ben Bateman stole the movie release date slides from Mance. You could argue and, that he earned it. Yes, yes. He did, in fact, earn it in a heads-up match. Yeah. That was that was a stipulation that was on the line. Um, that, that was a really crazy stipulation Mance agreed to, if you ask me. I was yelling at him. I was there for that. I was like, don't do it! I didn't know that was going to be on the line. I'm like, don't do it, you moron! <laughs> but I think that speaks to his his confidence, though. Yeah. So I don't I don't entirely blame him, but still. No, no, no um, I, don't, I don't blame him either. But at the same yeah. time, I was just like, it seemed like so much of a risk because <laughs> this is one of the reasons why this match is really really excited. Now I'm not as familiar with Adam Lavik's uh, uh, skill set in regards to the movie release dates. I know Sam knows his stuff, but let's be honest here. What we're really going to this match for is a rematch between Ben Bateman and Scott Mance. Each of them on their like their best category like the category right. that like not only their best category because like ben bateman's also good at like oscars and, and a variety of other things but the category that they're good at that almost no one else is really good at so that's gonna be a really exciting match my question for you frank do you think they're, they're the the wheel slice is going to be back on the line i think it should i think, I think so it was, it, was it confirmed was it confirmed? Because I don't know. I, I would love to see that, like, just all of a sudden, whoops, now it's Adam Lavix. Like, I would love but, to, That would be great. <laughs> yeah, but if I was Ben Bateman, I would never put it on the line ever again. Never. So that way his face remains eternal on the slice, no matter what. Unless, of course, something else, you know, happens. If you think about it, if it is an exhibition match, if there is a stipulation like that, does that actually make this an exhibition match? I mean, yes, because it, it still doesn't, doesn't affect count. stats. Yeah, it's just more of the the it, story that it's, it's bragging rights. Although that, yeah. that that raises an interesting question because like because this is Patreon exclusive content and because you know they have to make sure that it's not something that you have to watch in order to enjoy the game right now. Uh, and you honestly, you can't even really go into a lot of detail about these matches on the rundown. Otherwise, it would kind of defeat the purpose of making them Patreon exclusives. I am curious, because I don't hear you guys talking about them too much. What do you think about how those matches have shaped up? We started getting those about halfway through the year. What, what do you like so far? Which, what are your favorites so far, and what do you like about them? Well, I think my favorite one so far has been the Jurassic Park one. That was the Jurassic Park Iron Man match. It, it was very reminiscent of the Ken Napsack and Whitworth Star Wars Iron Man match we had uh, last Spectacular. Uh, and that went down to the last question. It was a crazy back and forth between Cody and Perry. And uh, I love that we get, we're get we getting specialized matches. And that's what's great about Patreon is that we can do these sorts of things without it actually impacting the overall story arc and standings of the Shmodan. We can still have our fun and, and we, we can have our cake and eat it too. So it's a lot of fun. I, I can tell you as a competitor uh, that the element of those just being fun and not having our stats on the line yeah. really changes the atmosphere in the room. A lot of us, you know, it's really intense, especially when you've been built up a bit or, or when you've had like some ups and downs to just be able to go out there and just answer some questions and hang out with your friends and not worry about whether or not this means you won't get to play for the rest of the season is a real treat. Yeah, and you, can t and you can really see that with that first exhibition underground match, that fatal four-way, which I think happened. Uh, five-way? It was a five-way. It was the five-way with Andrako, yeah. Roca, Bibbs, uh, who Levine, was it? Levine, Sam. Levine, yeah. 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 yeah, and and you could tell, because that's yeah. the, also the, the great thing about it, is it's just so laid back. There's nothing on the line. It just feels like it's super, super chill. And I like the atmosphere. And as I kind of agree with Frank that the Jurassic Park match is kind of like the pinnacle of the matches so far, but the horror match was fantastic. Mm -hmm. Love that horror match. They've all been great. Yeah, they, they've, know. they've all been fantastic. And I can't wait for the uh, holiday movies one, too, that's in December. So uh, it's just it's just making it's making your dollar worth it, basically. Yeah, and speaking of dollar, if you're at least at the dollar level as a Patreon, you will get this two, two weeks 
after its initial release at the end of the month. If you're $10 or up in the Patreon, you'll get it at the end of the month. So uh, even if you're, again, if you're not at the $10 level, you'll get it two weeks later from the release. So I highly encourage anyone who's not a part of the Patreon, if you can do it, at least do the $1. You'll get this great match. I'm sure it's going to be a great match a couple weeks after its initial release. Now, uh, last bit of news here, um, because it was, I guess, some point of... Uh, argument or controversy if you will the fact that mike kalinowski gave himself a title match against mark Kanopic at the spectacular uh, a lot of people thought well why isn't it jason inman why isn't there a normal contenders match between adam Klavik and rachel cushing or uh, jason inman some kind of combination like that and uh, christian finally had to come out and say you know what like i'm not usually i don't want to break kayfabe here but the fact of the matter is Inman had a scheduling issue and we're not really sure how it's going to work out. So we took a real life circumstance and kind of used it for a story effect within the Schmodown. And it made sense because of Kalinowski's storyline. So if you want to read that whole statement, that's also on the Facebook uh, group page. Um, so go ahead and check out that full explanation. He goes into some other details, but that's basically the gist of it, scheduling. And so I understand why people, even I was on here, I was on here saying that it was ridiculous that Kalinowski got um the title shot gave himself a title shot because it should have been Inman or Rachel or you know there should have been some sort of number one contender match at the very least but I understand the reasoning and uh so I hope everybody else can understand that I mean this is not um Bibbs this isn't the showdown isn't your full-time job this is no one's full-time job so things like this happen and it's unfortunate but we make the best of it and I think we did make the best out of it by using the storyline point to put Kalinowski in that spectacular match. And he's and he's definitely worthy of that shot. I mean, look, when it comes right down to it, uh, the Schmodown, you know, it's a sport and it's also a show. And uh, the show sometimes has to go on, even though maybe you know, certain specific circumstances aren't perfect. And uh, I, I actually had a conversation with Christian about this, you know, the story point, this move, mm-hmm. and, you know, just talking about the pros and cons of it. And one thing he just made really clear to me, and I think he's right about this, is that the spectacular is the end of the season event. You want an inner geek to match. You want a match of every league. You want as much yeah. content, as much representation of the various skill sets of the league going, and you want an inner geek to match. And this was the best case scenario. So I think it's going to be a great match. I mean, they came down to the last question last time. Yeah. They're both incredibly talented, Mark Anopic and Mike Kalinowski. Um, I think, you know, if he wins or loses, it's probably going to be controversial just based on the storyline. And we can continue to have that conversation. That's half the fun. So, yeah, it's, 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 not, it's an odd situation, but we're working with it, and I think it's going to lead to a great show and a great match. And that's ultimately the important thing. And it also, it, it doesn't just exemplify the league with him being there. It also exemplifies literally the entire season due to the fact that Mike Kalinowski is in fact basically the main villain of this arc of this entire show so far. So him being in the championship match is just good on both a theatrical level on, on top of it being a necessity. Yep. Yeah, you know, actually, as I'm thinking back to my initial response to it when I was on the, talking about on on the show, I think I said, I get it from a story point, but games wise, like it doesn't make that much sense to me. But again, you know, real life kind of impacts sometimes how the way these things go. Mm-hmm. Um, now let's get into this week's matches. Again, we talked about the gauntlet. We had three matches, two uh, separate matches to get to a final gauntlet. Then that winner. We'll play, we'll play Clark Wolf in the in the first round of the Schmodown Singles Tournament. And the first matchup we had was a doubleheader, doubleheader on Tuesday was uh, Ben Bayman and Janine the Machine. Now, Janine was making a stir on the Facebook group saying, why did she have to play in this kind of match when Chance Ellison, he was already in the match as the seventh spot because he drew the magic number. And again, playing into the story that, you know, Chance is aligned with Kalinowski. So, of course, he pulled the magic number and all this. And I think it was a great bit of fun uh, on Janine's part. And it really played into what they were talking about uh, to start the match with Jay and Janine. And then obviously, you know, we had Ben and, and, and Riley's there with, with Finstock that, that whole trifecta, that's really, um, uh, Bibiani, when you look at Ben and, you know, who's the boss, the whole team, what do, what do you think about their uh, dynamics? Okay. You know, of, of all of the anarchy teams, uh, uh, barring the Harris brothers, which is an unusual case because they had to find a replacement, but of all like the randomly selected, uh, anarchy teams, 
I was surprised at how well they gelled. Not just like in story wise, because they're both really good performers, but also just their skill sets. You know, they both have very specific specialties. Um, which don't 100% overlap. But for me, I think the measure of a good team is a, a, a large overall knowledge because in team play, I don't think people think about this enough, the first round is everything. If you win more points in the first round than any other round unless you're stealing a ton of points in round two. Uh, so if you have people with like really good general knowledge and they can just clean up points in round one, the game is basically over. And they're both really, really good at that. They both... Put on the points, then they they've have spectacular luck at that wheel, and then the third round they're pretty consistent and really good. So they're just good players. They match up well together. They complement each other well, and I see I love watching them evolve over time. And you get to see like how they like at first it was really awkward, and it's starting to get more comfortable. But like on any sort of there's like a cognitive dissonance. You look at them, Mark and Ben and. Dagnino? Yeah, they're all from they're from all over the place. <laughs> that shouldn't work. Yeah. That shouldn't work at all. And yet like if you got chocolate in my peanut butter, somehow it works out. Now, uh coming into this match, statistically Ben Bateman was uh at 69% accuracy, Janine in her rookie year uh averaging about 66% accuracy rate. So, let's get into this first round. Um, Ben Bateman, you know, Janine starts off strong in her first three. Ben only one of his first three, and then he kind of picks it up a little bit. He ends with four for the round, which is way below average for him. He's usually near that six-point level. And Janine, uh, she gets five, so she has a one-point lead on the boss. And she was, she started off strong, kind of fall through there towards the end, but she comes out with a lead, which is very important in any match, especially a gauntlet uh, tournament qualifying matches. And so she she looked strong and she looked comfortable. She looked, uh, she had a great first of all, great entrance. Oh my out, god, uh, yes! Right? Oh my god, we were all talk about that, Bibbs. Oh, I want to talk about that because listen, yeah. <laughs> I, I I love I love a good entrance and I hate a bad entrance. And she makes a good entrance. Janine is like a lot of players. You'll notice uh, when they enter the league, the thing they want to focus on most is the game and then maybe the smack talk. The entrance is often an afterthought for a lot of people. Janine came out swinging early on, and she has really embraced every aspect of the game. I think she's a tougher player than people realize. Mm -hmm. um, and she's one of those people, like Ben, actually, whose record doesn't necessarily match her uh, overall knowledge base. It's just at some point, someone has to lose, and she's lost a few times. Um, but yeah, she, she goes all out for that entrance. She's all up on that cosplay. And man, her Misty Knight was so good. Misty Knight compliments her. That's right. I saw that. That was incredible. So she posted a picture of Misty Knight, and the actor who plays Misty Knight on Luke Cage actually just said she was it was it was amazing, and it was. And I was there, and you, you could see that that ro that robot arm. It was really convincing. Like she did a really good job with it. So kudos to her. Like that was really oh, yeah. incredible. Um, but and yeah, yeah. And one thing that I noticed about Janine here is now this was her her fourth match singles match this season. And I have to say, this is the most comfortable I've ever seen Janine this season. And I think that, obviously, that's going to come with time competing on that kind of stage. And so, with her coming out coming out strong out the gate, getting her first three quick... quick wow, I can't speak. Her first three <laughs> cushions quick. I don't know if that made sense. Um, and to Ben's one... And she was feeling, and she looking very comfortable up there. I thought Ben's in for a hell of a ride, and for the most part, he was that first mm -hmm. round. He's really trying to fight back the whole time. Uh, I thought Janine was gonna was gonna pull it off. Uh, she was very close in that triple threat number one contenders match back at Collision. So you know she was two and one coming into this match. I thought she had a great shot, and she showed why she does definitely deserve to be in the league. Why was she, why she was in the conversation for Rookie of the Year. Um, but let's get into round two here. Janine, she's with, again with that one point lead. The first to Ben Bateman. He gets new releases and he takes it and he gets all four right for seven points. And that automatically puts the pressure right back on Janine. Um, because yes, he had, Ben had a, had a weak first round, weaker than normal than he, than he usually plays, but he came back strong in that second round and nearly got all eight possible points. And I have to think... That when you're in Janine's spot, you were feeling good, but then Ben comes right back. So you can't ever let your guard down against Ben. 
And then Janine, she spins away from Oscars and ends up landing on Coming of Age. Not a terrible category for her, but she does go to multiple choice a couple times. She only ends up getting four points out of four questions. But the big the big moment here in this round and really match-deciding moment uh, was when Ben was able to capitalize on her fourth and final question for a two-point steal, and that ended up giving him a 13-9 to lead. Uh, Be- uh, Bibiani, what can you tell us about getting when when your opponent steals on you on your very last question in the second round i don't i haven't had that many steals against me i if, if memory serves so it's, it's not mm, like that might be true i i, I it, it's something that like I, I i don't know if i've ever had a cataclysmic steal against me mm-hmm. um i don't i think it usually boiled down to me just not knowing a question at some point in like the third round but um it's frustrating i can tell you that much and you can see it rankles someone because it's the situation it's the one time in the game really where it's not just like, oh, I, I got a point and they didn't get a point. It's I got I didn't get a point and they get to kind of gloat about it and like really brandish yeah. it in round two. It's different in round two. Um, and the stakes are higher and the points are higher. So it's frustrating. I, I guarantee it's frustrating, especially in a game like this where you're trying to make up ground. You know, one of the one of the hardest I think decisions a player has to make over time, um, and I you know because the schmodown what it boils down to is if you get all the questions right you win, that's what it boils down to. But in the end, there are a lot of little strategies, and one of the strategies every player has to decide. And some people have a very hard fast rule about it. Some people judge it by the game, like I do. When you're up in round two, do you go first or second? That's the real question. So. Some people, like Sam, I've heard Sam defend his uh, uh, his belief that it's better to go uh, second. Yeah, it's better yeah. to go second because that way you know how many points that your team, that, that your opponent has cast, and then that can make you decide whether or not it's worth risking a two-pointer or whether it's safe to go to multiple choice and how much is on the line, how comfortable should you be with your first category, and that's a really good idea. On the other hand... If you can build up a suicide lead by going first, that is also a psychological effect because now there's a lot of pressure on your opponent. And I think that's what uh, happened here. I think there was just a lot of pressure on Janine, and I think you can feel it watching the game. You know, it becomes, like, she started off on top, and now it's like an underdog thing just because Ben cleaned up, as Ben often does. Like, I keep waiting for him to, like, I, I don't know what his bad category is. Like, there are categories he's not great at, he didn't do great at action that one time, but, like, is there a category that he just, like, I've never seen a biopic, or I don't know, like, something. I yeah. don't know, well, I don't know what it is. I've never seen him bomb the second round. Well, this, that that point you bring up, actually, and, and spoiler, that kind of goes into the article you wrote about stalling uh, in the second round, or stalling on your answers, because... He, which he, which he, which he has made famous in the Schmodown, uh, waiting to the last second to give your answer, whether it's right or wrong, it, it masks whether or not you're good in that category or not. And so I think that's something that Ben's developed uh, in the league, and it's and I don't know that it really applied here because Jenny was going second, but um, but to, it, it speaks to Ben's broader game across his career in the Schmodown. Uh, um, Ben, ben yeah, and, like like I said, Janine is a fully formed player, and so is Ben. And by say, when I say fully formed, is they're not just good at one thing; they're good at a lot of things. Ben is has one of the best developed persona of anyone in the Schmodown, and one of the things that comes with that is a level of consistency, like his his character, if you will, uh, behaves consistently. And almost any question I've ever seen him answer in round two or three, when it's relevant, is he pulls the stall and. Mm-hmm. What that does is it basically keeps the questions that are hard a secret. It gives him as much time as he can. He's always plays it the same way. He plays it very stone faced. He wears the sunglasses, and I don't think that's just because sunglasses are cool and he's playing like a cool Hollywood guy. I, he's preventing you from seeing any flash of emotion or concern in his eyes. And I think that affects the other player, and I think that affects the audience as well. And sometimes, and I've seen it happen, it can be a real pain in the butt. And you just were like, dude, just answer the question. Yeah. Just answer the question. But that means it's effective. Yeah. That means it's very, very effective. So, yeah, it's hard to tell what he's legitimately bad at because he never breaks character. He never, like, you know, he's never, like, playing poker, and he's just like, ah, I got nothing. I mean, um... Four aces. 
Like <laughs> right. he, never, he never does it. He's, he's really, really talented at that part of the game, and that makes him really, really difficult to play against and also mm-hmm. to interact with when you're at the bench. You know, when you're at that table and, you know, you're just you're pulling off a couple of snarky moves, you're trying to entertain people, trying to get under your opponent's skin, he's one of the best at that. And, you know, one thing I want to say about his, his tactic is I'm curious, did, does, did his, does his persona kind of inform the way he plays the game by being, like, he's, he's brash, but he's also trying to get on your skin as his character? Did that inform this tactic of stalling and, and you know, uh, ticking off your opponent? Or was this tactic kind of also helping inform his persona? If you, if you see where I'm getting at that, I'm trying to stall, but I can also use this as part of my persona. So it kind of ties in really well together. And, and, yeah, you can't really figure out what in the world's going on in his brain. I think it's a chicken and the egg situation. I think it is organic, um, but it is calculated as well, and they do just sort of emphasizing it. Um, I haven't talked to him a lot about, about this technique, but, uh, you know, it's it's clear that he's doing it on purpose. He does it every time. He's not like me, where if I get excited, I'll just whip out the answer. He <laughs> right. always is thinking, and sometimes he doesn't know it. Every once in a while, he doesn't know it, and it's a real surprise, because it seems like he's just being cocky. But usually it seems like he does. But there's a danger with that, and I want to talk about that when we talk about round three. Sure, yeah, let's get into round three right now because, yeah, like I said, Janine was down four points going into into the final round. She gets her two-pointer right, misses on her sports, um, and then she pulls out uh, a Disney question. Um, Chris, do you remember that Disney question, or Bibbs, do you remember? It was the name, it of, was, it was the name of Hades' minions yes, in Hercules. That was a That's, hell of a pull. That's a good pull. That's a good pull. I mean, it's not the most obscure thing ever, but it's a movie not a lot of people talk about. No one quotes it unless they're thinking about maybe who put the glad and gladiator Hercules. Um, but yeah, she she knew that. I didn't know that. I would have I would have lost that question. That was a good pull. That was just a, a good a great, pull. It's a great pull in a tough spot because you miss that, you lose the game. She gets it to hang on. And and to to force some sort of pressure on Ben, uh, unfortunately, it wasn't enough because then he would get his two and three pointer correct. Um, but like now, at that uh, point, I w- I don't yeah. want to say at that point when you're down in round three and you're down pretty far in round three, there are two levels of victory. There's maybe I can win this, but you know the further down you are, the less likely that is. But at that point, you just don't want to get TKO'd. Yeah. That's what, you, and she avoided the TKO. That means that she had a, the most respectable showing she could possibly have. But sometimes the point spread is just against you. Uh, but yeah, Ben had to answer at least two of his questions, or, or I think only the five might have sufficed. I'm trying to remember what the yeah, actual point. Yeah, was. yeah, it would have. Yeah, yeah, but like mm-hmm. he, whatever, he needed to get the five uh, or the three, and he did. That's what he does. Uh, he, he gets some questions right, uh, but it came down for him to his three pointer. And this, I'm surprised there wasn't more, con- I'm surprised they didn't, like, challenge this, because he pulled his stall, and he used a GTE rule, which I think he, it, this feels like something he would know, but maybe he was being extra cautious, just to make sure, because so much is yeah. on the line. It's a game uh, winner, too. Yeah, It's a game winner, it's an important thing to get right, but the answer, the question was, which two uh, Tarantino alumni reunited for the movie Basic? And he waited, used the JTE rule, he waited, last possible second said, Travolta and Sam Jackson. Only Travolta. There are other Travoltas who act. Hmm. That could have been, you know, listen, it's clear he knew the right answer, but people have been dinged on technicalities before, I give you John Roca. Where, <laughs> you know, like, you know, clearly yeah. there's, uh, on some level, the, the, the answer to the question was accurate. But the rules are the rules, and they're the rules for a reason, and you can't really start making exceptions because then people start to abuse them. So that could have been a challenge, and if he had waited that much longer and then used that question and then got cocky with it and then just let slip out Travolta and then he lost that challenge, it would have been down to his five, and who the hell knows? A five-pointer could be really, really hard. He's lost on a five-pointer before, if memory serves. So the stall is really dangerous. The stall can be a dangerous move because you're putting all your eggs in that last basket. So, I'm, I don't. It didn't backfire this time, but you saw how it could, and I think that's yeah, interesting. Yeah, potentially, potentially. Yeah, I didn't really think too much about that Travolta, Sam Jackson, or just use, just saying Travolta. I didn't think too much of it because you're right. It does. It seems obvious. Like he knows the answer. And, mm-hmm. um, but the rules are the rules for a reason, and there are other Travoltas. So, so I would have challenged it. It might have. might have failed. I would have challenged if I were playing. <laughs> On IMDb, there's literally an actor named Travolta. <laughs> 
That's it? <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, my God, that's amazing. There that's you go. Uh, clearly it was that guy. Come on. That's right. Not not John Travolta. Yeah. I um, guarantee you he knew it was really John Travolta, but the rules yeah. are the rules, and it's, and it's a challenge-worthy answer. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. It I might, think, not, yeah. might not have gone my way, but I think I, I think I would have had a good challenge if that were me. Yeah, yeah. I think I think you would have wasted your challenge on that. Well, at that point, it, but yeah, well, but at, at that point, the game is all, it is over if he gets it right. So sure. I might as well try, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so he does he does defeat Janine the Machine eighteen to sixteen, and then he would await the winner of Lon Harris, Josh McCougal, although we don't although we do know who he faces, obviously. But let's talk about that match. Lon Harris versus Josh McCougal. Uh Bibbs, I want to get your take on Josh McCougal though. Because he's a guy that has hovered his entire showdown career around uh five hundred. He was uh eight and nine coming into this match. Um what what do you think about Josh McCougal and the way he's been able to just he hasn't been terrible but he hasn't been great he actually had a really great match earlier this year against nick scarpino where he was phenomenal in that one he can pull off those performances it was alluded before i think in the in the pre-hype package that you know he's defeated clark wolf before he's pulled up these upsets before um he had a monstrous comeback in that five round grudge match against uh dagnino where he or finstock uh, or against fake stock when it was uh and draco and uh he was down like six points and he came back to win it. We were all uh, shocked you, that that one happened. Yeah. We were all like, what do you, what wow. Do you think of, <laughs> what do you think about Josh when, when he competes? You know, Josh is Josh is another one who I think he's, he's a complete uh, competitor as well. But in the, the, it's skewed a little differently. Whereas I think Janine is a movie trivia master who does who also does theater stuff and does it really, really well. I think... Makuga is so much about the presentation that people forget he actually knows a fair amount of trivia. Now, he might Absolutely. not have like this in-depth, you know, IMDb library in his head that some people do, but he has a very varied uh uh, uh breadth of knowledge and I think it helps that he's on so many shows talking about movies all the time and it really just keeps him a little fresh. Osmosis, him, you know. Yeah, well, it yeah. keeps you like it keeps you like in a really general way. Like for example, someone like Bateman or like me, or like Drew McQueenie, or people who review movies on the regular, new releases is might be a little easier for some of us than other people because we watch all the new movies and we're not cherry picking them. Uh, you know, Josh stays on top of everything he has to, and he's picked up a lot of stuff. Now, there's a lot of classic stuff. Like if he, I would be, I don't think he would necessarily be the greatest on like Hitchcock or whatever like that. Right. But who knows? Maybe I don't know. That's the cool thing about Makuga. He knows enough about movies that he can kind of infer what he doesn't know. And that's a really tricky skill. When you don't know the answer to something, you want to put out a guess. Because otherwise, you, even if you know you're wrong, people get on you if you don't put out a guess. Makuga doesn't just put out a guess. He formulates a reason for his guess to be right. And sometimes he's right. And that's a tough skill to develop and to get right as often as he does that's that's really really difficult so i would never i feel like me and makuga are probably on a collision course because right now i think we kind of have the same stats I mean, he has more matches but i think we're both like 50 50 even though like we're differently ranked sure. like i feel like it's only a matter of time before i face makuga <laughs> and i'm kind of scared because man you just you never know what he knows and you never know what he doesn't know that he's gonna be able to pull out of his ass yeah and that's I mean, really really scary you catch him on a great day. You can be you can be in trouble because I mean, yes, he has a limited scope of of what he knows he knows. But if he gets lucky on a wheel slice, he picks the right numbers and he gets his sweet spots. You know, he can he can burn you real good. Well, I mean, like, and I think a lot of people thought like, oh, Makuga going up against Lon Harris, this is going to be you know a cakewalk or whatever. And Makuga held his own. Like he did pretty good for a lot of the match. Um, but, you know, you never know. Sam Levine, you know, uh, arguably the GOAT, and I think one of the people who has thought out the game more than most other competitors. Yeah. Like, he has a reason why he does stuff. And he has a great point. Um, and I think I've articulated it here before as well. You, it, it, you're only, like, everyone can have a good day. You know, it might seem like someone, know, like Dan Merle. He's one of the smartest competitors, one of the most well-informed competitors. He lost to Drew Guy, who is also a smart guy, but... We all thought that was going to be an easy match, and it wasn't, because Drew was on his game, Dan got some questions that were hard for him, and bada-bing. Right. So, 
when it comes to Lon Harris. He's had this situation before where it seemed like, oh, we're giving, we're giving, what was it, Cody? Yeah, Cody. For, yeah, for like, match of the year. For, for yeah, the year. Uh, uh, Lon versus Cody. We all know that not, it's not just his persona. Lon knows his stuff. Back when I used to work at a video store with Lon, I was like milking Lon for like movie recommendations <laughs> and stuff I needed to watch. Some of my favorite movies I watched because Lon recommended them to me in that in those years. He knows his stuff. That doesn't mean he's always going to win. And like and Cody, like did real good. Like he got a perfect round one. Yeah, perfect round. It was yeah. and the bonus. Yeah, yeah. It was a real thrill to watch that match because like yeah, he just did not see that coming. Cody like almost killed him. Like he did an amazing <laughs> job. So like this is one of those matches where Lon Harris. I will you know if you want to learn about movies, if you want to read about movies, you want to hear about movies, you want to talk to this guy. He's one of the most intelligent people ever. That doesn't mean his game is always on. So I was really excited for this match because who the hell knows what's going to happen? And then it turned out to be a relatively straightforward match, but it still it worked. But, uh, yeah, let's get into this match. The first round, uh, Lon Harris goes 8 for 8. Couldn't come up with the bonus. Uh. And Josh McCuga, he puts up 5 points, which is the league average, so it's not like you know he's he's in the dumps uh, in, in terms of answering first-round questions. 8 to 5, it's not a terrible deficit. Uh, but when you go up against the line here, is he, that's what he puts up. Seven, eight points uh, a ton of the time. Now, uh, with a three-point deficit, uh, Makuga... You know, Lon Harris actually opts to go first. He spins on crime, and this is where oh it gets God. really interesting because he 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 misses on his first two, but then hits his last two for four points in this round on his turn. And some thinking, of those questions were hard. I'm sorry, that yeah. first qu- mobsters. I'm not usually the kind of person who is just like, what the hell movie is that? I have no that movie like totally slipped <laughs> under my ride. Christian Slater played Lucky Luciano. How have I not seen this wonderful movie? Obviously, <laughs> it's got to be some sort of masterpiece. So like, I was just like, I saw his face and I felt it. I'm just like, what the hell movie is that? And I love that moment. But man, every once in a while, you think like, oh, crime. Okay, I've seen a lot of crime movies. Almost every movie has some sort of crime in it. <laughs> like there's crime True. everywhere. Yeah. So like it's a really like drama. Broad, yeah, yeah. It's a really broad category, and yeah, uh, uh, Tricky Skaliski, man, he just like threw in like a real curveball on that one. So yeah, yeah, that's a that, crime is tough. Crime is one of the tougher categories, if you ask me, in the whole game. Had Josh been able to pull out one of those two steals of those obscure cuts, that mm-hmm. would have been moment of the year. <laughs> I think so, man. That would have been and, real tough. And the funny thing is, he we all know he's fully capable of pulling out these kinds of moments, and that's what makes Josh McCuga so great uh, in the Schmodown. Now, getting into McCuga's uh, turn here, he spun new releases, and he opts to spin away. He ends up on opponent's choice, and what does Lon give him? He gives him romance. Now, Christian and Alice get to kind of point out, well, you know, Maguga's not that bad at rom-coms, and, and romance can fall in there. Uh, so it may not go the way Lon Harris thought, um, but it did for the most part because uh, Josh Maguga only got three points, uh, even though Lon wasn't even able to capitalize on any of those misses as well. So at the end of two rounds, it was 12 to 8. Not a great showing from Makuga. Uh, I've always say you at least want to be in double digits coming out of that second round. And uh, too bad for Makuga. So now he's trailing by four. Not a good deficit. Uh, he has to go through... Um, well, I'm sorry. He gets through McConaughey and directors to send it back to Lon. And it's an animated category question and sends it back to Makuga for a Charlie Sheen five pointer. What are the odds? Why do we still uh, have this category? It's such a weird category. It's so bizarre. I would like to see more, like, because we have, like, we're adding more categories. Like, we added, like, I think we added Kate Blanchett this year or recently. And that mm-hmm. makes sense. Cause she's got this really, really big filmography of really varied motion pictures, blockbusters, indies. Charlie Sheen? Why don't we have an Emilio Estevez category? Like, why don't we just have something, think- like, completely random? Like, why not? I don't know. Well, I think that harkens back to, that's a throwback to the 2014 inaugural season where, you know, it was just a bunch of them getting together, having fun on the Schmoes No podcast show, and Charlie Sheen and uh, categories like Van Damme, 
you know, Sly and Arnie was one of the, you know, it, it harkens back to that. So I enjoy when a, a category like this pops up or like a Pauly Shore, for instance, might pop up. It harkens back to those 2014 days. You don't see it too often, but when they do, I get a little smile on my face because it goes back to that 2014 season. Yeah. Um, I mean, but it's, it's about Lucas, which is a legitimately good movie. So mm. at least there's at least there's that. <laughs> at least uh, there's that. Now, uh, unfortunately, yeah, Makuga loses. He's out of the tournament. Doesn't get a shot at Clark Wolf again for a tournament. That would have been that would have been something else to see uh, Makuga uh, go up, have Wolf Makuga three. Whoever would have thought that would have happened? <laughs> it didn't, but it, it was a possibility, which was funny and all in itself. Uh, now getting to the gauntlet final between Lon Harris and Ben Bateman. Uh, I think a lot of people would have picked Lon Harris just based on his knowledge, but Ben Bateman is a gamesman through and through. Uh, what did you think of this matchup, Bibbs, when you, when you saw that this was the, also the match you're going to be calling? Yeah, okay. So, uh, first off, I want to make it abundantly clear, even though I, like, stepped in for that last game, all of these really were done on the same day in rapid succession. So, by this point, Lon and Ben, they're already, you know, a little punchy. You know, yeah. like halfway through the last bit of Rocky, you know, just sort of leaning on each other like, oh, God, I can't remember any more movies. <laughs> Uh, so I was, it was really exciting to be there and like to see like the build up to it. And they were both really into it and they both really wanted to win. Um, this was as even a match, at least on paper, uh, as I think any you're likely to see in, in the, 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 the singles tournament, even though this isn't arguably a tournament match, this is a tournament level match yeah, because absolutely. Ben Bateman, again, he knows his stuff. He is one of the smarter, like, in, uh, we look at, like, some of the elder statesmen, like, in the league, someone like Drew McQueenie, he's been doing this for a really long time, um, and, like, you know, as a result, their knowledge base seems really deep because they've been paying attention, they've been alive longer. For a young man, Ben knows his stuff. He really takes it seriously, and that's something I was really impressed by with him, even off camera. Just every time we talk about movies, um, we don't always agree on everything, but I always respect the amount of knowledge he has and the amount of intensity he has when it comes mm -hmm. to learning more about movie history. So he knows his stuff. And so does Lon. Lon is like the literal, the old school video store clerk who has watched everything in the store. Uh, so it's a good match on paper. It's, it's exciting to watch. I was really, really happy to be there for it. And, um, yeah, I was, I was stoked. I think this is like the kind of match you want to watch. I think this is the, sometimes you just see a match and it seems like it's a little lopsided here. Boom. Great matchup. This could have been like the first match of the year and it would have been an exciting start to the season. Before we get into the match, I kind of want to talk about the post-match and and the pre-match interview that Lon did because he's uh, he's dropping all these you know, these names of I guess film history. I guess did you know any of these names? Because I had I think I knew oh, I, like I, one I, I, name. I'm trying to remember, <laughs> but yeah, like they're they're real. Like Abbas Kiarostami is one of the greatest filmmakers in the world. He's directs very quiet movies. So I'm not sure how familiar or, or how excited some Shmodan fans would be to read him. But not, I don't think I've ever heard, seen him drop a fake name. Those are all real names and there's a lot of I'm glad he does actually because there's this yeah. whole world of cinema that doesn't really get highlighted as much on the Schmodown and I understand why but it is kind of a bummer and I kind of wish we had like a Criterion slice or something <laughs> like or something with the really or deep a, art house a Criterion cuts. exhibition match at least. that would also be really really cool because I, I think one of the cool things in the Schmodown is that it can really help educate people about aspects of cinema they weren't familiar with. And I'm seeing this even behind the scenes. Like when you, you mentioned it before, when they started, it was kind of a jokier, a kind of a bro mm -hmm. kind of competition with stuff like Polly Shore and Jean Claude Van Damme. And nowadays, like matches are won and lost based on how much, how, how well you know Julia Roberts movies. You know, like it's, it's, we're, it, it, I think it took too long, but I think we're here now, and I think we're starting to see that you need to have a wide variety of knowledge across all different genres. You don't get to say, oh, I don't like rom-coms, and expect to win anymore. You right. need to know this stuff, and you need to respect various different uh, uh, corners of the motion picture industry and various genres and filmmakers. So I would like to see that extend to... Like, yeah, we have a French New Wave category, or, or, or at least question, you know? Like, I think there's, it'd be nice to sort of bring that up. And I like that Lon 
at least mentions all that stuff, even while he's answering questions about, you know, 10 things I hate about you, which is fine. It's just not a deep cut. Right, right. Yeah. I know. I do appreciate Lon doing that because it really just, you know, speaks to his character, that his persona he plays on the show, and it, it really gives it validity about, you know, I mean, you think like, wow, this he really does know what he's talking about, or at least he's... he's you well, know, I... And what? you can, I know, and you can see like the questions that he loses are often like really lowbrow. Like there's just like sure. the kind of the ch- like he, like ten things I hate yeah. about you, which isn't really lowbrow, but it's a teen romantic comedy. It's an unusually good one, but it's like it's not going to get a Criterion collection anytime soon. But right. like, <laughs> if you asked him a question about last year at Marion Bad or or Oh Hazard Balthazar, I would expect him to get it right. These are like the classy types of things that he gravitates to. And I'm glad that there's an outlet for that. And I, I think you're thinking right, maybe we should have a Criterion exhibition match of some kind someday in the future with Lon and I bet Mark Hoyk would kill that and Whitney Seibel mm. would kill that. And I'd probably do okay, but I'll bet those guys know even more than I do. All right, now let's talk about the match itself, uh, Harris and Bateman. Now, now you mentioned that th- this is some, one of the more evenly matched matchups uh, that you're going to see because you know looking at, looking at their stats, uh, Lon Harris he was averaging 74 percent accuracy coming into this match. Ben Bateman 70 percent, so not that much of a difference there. But it was Lon Harris he came out on top uh, in the first round, six to five. Uh, they were both kind of just going. Uh, hitting the both the same questions, missing the same question. So, I mean, it was very obvious through their stats and on screen that they were very evenly matched. They both knew the same stuff, were missing the same stuff, uh, but Lon was able to come out one point ahead. And with that, he goes first and he spins opponent's choice. And this is and this is where uh, we have to speak to Ben's... Um, um, his attention to other players in the league. He, he studies people, he, he takes note of people, and he knew the best option for him on that wheel was to give Lon animated. And I thought it was the best move he could have done in this match, and it worked for him for the most part. Yeah, I'm trying to think of what else was on that wheel, but I think that was kind of perfect because Lon knew some of those questions, but yeah. they, they, a lot of them were, were like, look at round one. They Neither of them knew that open season question. There's a lot right. of animated movies that don't become blockbusters or aren't considered classics and just kind of disappear. So this was a good category pick for Ben Bateman, and it just goes to show, like, again... Strategy is something that players should think about. Sometimes it doesn't factor into anything. Like, you can, like, if you're playing Ben Bateman or whatever, and you're just like, oh, God, he's going to put Oscars on that wheel. I'd better bone up on my Oscars. And then neither of you spin it, and all of that, you know, didn't really matter. So here's a situation where knowing your opponent and knowing that they have certain skills and certain maybe not so much weaknesses, but stuff that isn't necessarily in their wheelhouse... That became everything, and I bet you anything that if Lon had gotten almost any other category just by random, this game might have gone a totally different direction. Absolutely, I think it's probably it's a much tighter game. Bateman probably has. I mean, this probably goes down to the last five pointer, I would think. Um, but what's interesting here too, though, is uh, Ben Bateman once again gets an important steal on the last question of his opponent's second round of Lon's second round, and he can carry that over to his turn, in which he ends up getting Denzel Washington. Once again, he goes four for four, and he, and, uh, what do you call it? He gets seven, he gets seven points here, yeah. He gets seven points, so he outscores Lon here, eight to three in a second round, gives him a 13 to nine lead. Uh, This is nearly identical to what was going on in his first match against Janine. He found himself in a really good spot, and when he gets Denzel, I think everyone felt like he's going to do pretty good in this round, and and he showed up, and he he did what he had to do against a very tough opponent in Lon Harris. You got to take whatever luck you're given in this game and maximize it. And Ben's and Ben is really great at doing that. And he did it here in a big important spot. Yeah, no, uh, this, this is it basically, you know, again, I think Ben Bateman is, I think Drew's got this like locked up in teams, but in singles, I think Ben Bateman's kind of the king of the second round. And I think a lot of that boils down to, he's just really lucky with that wheel. Dear God, is he lucky with that wheel? I would yeah. kill for just a, carve off a slice of that and just like rub it on my on my hands just before I spin that wheel. I just be like, hey, like it'd be like a, in, in like a casino, like blow on these dice. Hey, Bateman, blow on my hands. <laughs> Boom. I think that would be great. But yeah, no, he he killed it. But that's all there is to it. There's no there's no more analysis here. He picked the right category for lawn. 
and then he got a category. It's not necessarily his wheelhouse, because his wheelhouse is really states and Oscars. Those are the two things that right. I would... It sucks to go up against him when he gets those. It sucks, because you know you're not going to get a steal. At worst, he's going to have to go to multiple choice. Like, you're not going to get a steal off of him. So, Denzel could have gone either way, but he knew his shit. Denzel is a great actor. He's been in a lot of great movies. Ben Bateman's clearly seen him. Right. And he he just killed it. Like, that's that's all you can kind of say about this round. Yeah. And, you know, he puts Lon Harris in a tight spot, down four points to Ben and uh, Lon. He, he, he charges back with his two and three pointer and then sends it back to Ben for a 70s category. Now, I thought Ben might be in some sort of trouble, even though it was a two pointer. But once I heard it was about. Uh, Saturday Night Fever, who sang, who sang the opening song. And he, come on, you got to know the Bee Gees. Uh, so that's a quintessential yeah. two pointer. Like it's yeah. you, you, should, you can know that without having seen the film. It's one of the best selling soundtracks ever. It's one of the most popular songs ever. I was a little mad, and I don't know if this is Skaliski or if this is whoever was doing uh, the subtitles, like at the bottom when they list the question, mm-hmm. because like it's it's stay in alive. <laughs> stay in alive is the name of the sequel to Saturday Night Fever. Stay in alive with an with an apostrophe at the end. That's the song. I that doesn't that doesn't change the game, but I just want people True. to know the difference because that's they, they should. That's important to me. Well, that, that's important to you, and it, yeah. and it's been noted for the record. Okay, <laughs> uh, enjoyed it. So now it goes back to Lon on a five pointer action adventure, and this question. Um, Ooh. You know. <laughs> Yeah, uh, the Wesley Snipes, and, and it ends up being Gary, Gary Busey's the uh, the answer. Was it Drop Zone? <laughs> Drop Zone, yeah. And uh, his his actually his guess was and you said it was like it's not that bad of a guess. When yeah, you think I, about I, it. I, it makes sense. Like it, it, given like so, the question was who's the bad guy in Drop Zone? Yeah. And uh, Drop Zone is a movie that we don't talk about anymore. It was from this brief period in the '90s where we wanted to make like Point Break sort of got people thinking like ah mm. oh, extreme sports would be a cool thing to do for movies and. After like Point Break, which is already kind of a cheesy movie, I mean, they just started to suck, and he started to get stuff like Drop Zone or Extreme Ops, and no one cared until Fast and the Furious made it about car racing and became its own thing. But right. yeah, like Drop Zone is a really forgettable and really forgotten action movie. It's a fair question. It's a perfectly valid five pointer. But man, if you haven't seen that movie lately, good luck. Good and luck I, knowing. And that. I do love Ben Bateman's. Um, answer or his reason why he knows the answer to this question because he had a shirt with Gary Busey on his shirt from this movie and that's how he <laughs> even knew this part. How do you have that shirt? <laughs> I want to see that shirt. I don't believe that shirt exists. There's no uh, way he, that shirt exists. He should definitely wear it around the yes. choir office one day. Just well, they have that like, new podcast. I want to see That's right. That's yeah. Right. And by the way, shout out, I haven't had a chance to listen to it yet, but they have that new Action Guys podcast over there. Um, their old their old show was awesome, and I'm glad they're over here now, and I can't wait to listen to that new show. And I'm going to do everything in my power to get on that show because I love talking to those guys, and they know their action. Yeah, it was a great it was a great moment, and it was a great match uh, all around. Great three matches really through this whole entire gauntlet. I think this gauntlet format um, was was really it was interesting, and I'm glad it worked out. And it's too bad we couldn't all see it happen all on one day. I think maybe in in the future, in the Schmodown future, uh, we could have a live stream thing. I know that's something Christian has talked about. This would be great for a live stream, three matches, the environment. The, I think everything would work out really well. This kind of little mini tournament gauntlet to get into the main, the big dance, if you will. Uh, I think it was really a lot of fun. And uh, I, I kind of wish, I was kind of thinking they should do these little, you know, little mini gauntlets for each seed in the tournament throughout the year, which would be kind of fun. I th- in some, I, some way. No, I think it's a really cool idea, and uh, I think this is a good way to get people pumped up for the singles tournament, because if you think about it, like, half the year has been tournaments. Yeah. Like, it really has, and then part of it is because, like, Sam left, and so we had this sort of mini tourneys in the summer in order to get to the, everyone to get to the belt faster, because we needed the belt holder, but, like, yeah, we had the inner geekdom from, like, beginning of summer, and then we had the teams for, like, a couple of months, and now we really only have so much time left for the singles tournament. Yeah. Like, I think previous years we've had much bigger singles, like, 18 people, like, 16 people. 16 last year, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, like. teams was, yeah. 
No, no, yeah, and that's and listen, I I, I love all of that, but we just we're kind of crunched for time. So I think this gauntlet, this real fast build up, this ramp up, if you will, yeah. uh, to the single sermon has been really, really great. Way I think people get really excited really quickly, and I cannot wait to see how the gauntlet, how the how the rest. Of, no, I have not seen any other matches. I cannot wait to see how the single the singles tournament turns out because. Everyone involved is really good at this. Yeah, it's like literally it's everyone. It's really, <laughs> it's really ridiculous. great. Like uh, uh, I'm trying to think. So like coming up next, we got like who's the boss versus the Harris brothers, which yeah. again I think is just perfectly calibrated. They're just on paper, they're perfect together. So I can't wait to yeah. see how that goes. But then we got and Draco versus Drew McQueenie. Holy crap! What a match. That's a great matchup. Yeah. We got Ethan Irwin versus Chance Ellison, like two of the best rookies of the year. That's incredible. And now we're going to have Clark Wolf versus Ben Bateman and, and like a rematch because they had that great team match. Right. These are stellar games. There's no, there's no one like, who? Like, no, these are like the top tier upper echelon. Not that they're the only ones, but like, this is good stuff. Yeah, I this is what you want to see. see. Yeah. So this is exciting. So yeah, I can't wait to see how the rest of the year shakes up. Yeah, and let's let's talk a little bit about um, the upcoming Team Anarchy team title match, uh, tournament match, team tournament title match. All you know what I'm talking about. Uh, who's the boss and and the Harris Bros? Man, this is going to be some sort of match, I think. And the way Lon has performed, I know he lost, but you know you said it before in teams that first round is everything and. If Lon has proven anything, he is one of the top players in the entire Schmodown when it comes to first round question. I mean, continually at eight points, nine points, getting a bonus. You know, it's going to be tough. And then you pair him with his brother, who's just as knowledgeable, uh, and you know he can put up five, six points. Although he he has been, in my eyes, a little just about an average player in the first round. But you know, it only takes one match. To really, you know, say, hey, I can put up seven or eight points, and then also, and also boss is in trouble. You know? and, and also, you know, he's new to this. You know, he kind of got, right. like, thrown in. Uh, and I think he's taken to it really, really well. He's got a persona. He's got a wide breadth of knowledge. Fun fact, you know, I went to, uh, I worked at a video store with Lon Harris. I went to film school with Jonathan Harris. He was in my Oof. class. So he is, the, we have the same background and everything. So he knows what I know. So he, this is a good team. Is Finstock coming to you for a scouting report now? Is that I don't, what's going to happen? I don't know, man, but it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's crazy. So like the fact that they're together and the fact that I have this weird relationship with them is kind of interesting. It feels like my life is kind of folding in on itself like a collapsing neutron star and uh, i can't wait to see just like oh is my like piano teacher from elementary school gonna show up now like who else from my past is gonna <laughs> emerge i don't know how it's gonna play out but yeah those guys know their stuff and so does who's the boss these are really yeah. well-rounded teams and i think it's just gonna boil down to it's gonna boil down to one of two things a slobber knocker match back and forth punching it out down to the last question is sudden death. I don't think we'd all love to see that. Or we're going to see either Bateman's going to get that magic and we're going to see a round two just kill somebody. Mm -hmm. Or the Harris brothers are going to pull the same thing and they're finally going to slice off some of that Bateman luck. Because that's, that's what I think it's going to boil down to. Either someone gets real fucking lucky in round two or in the betting round or in speed round as one team dominates. Yeah. Or, or it's going to be really, really close the entire way through. Uh, I, here's the deal. Either one of these teams, if they win, I think it poses a legitimate threat to the Shire Wolves, who, again, I think are the best team in the league. So I'm ex whoever wins in this team finals, spectacular is going to be great. Oh, yeah. And, you know, about this this match, this tournament title match, I think I think it's going to be a, a slobber knocker. I think it's going to be a drag-out fight. These two teams are just stellar. Um, although I do think that who's the boss would give Shire Wolves a better, a better match for the simple fact that they are both, both Ben and Riley are very, very experienced in this game and these settings, uh, you know, Riley's been a champ. Bateman is now going back to another tournament final. He was just in the tournament final last year with team action. So he's back in that spotlight again. He's, he's. You know, he's played in a live event against Clark. He knows what this is about, and that's why I think if they were to win, 
they would be the tougher matchup uh, for the Shire Wolves, but um, the title, the tournament title match is going to be great. And uh, real quick, also before we wrap all this up, we got to talk about some of these storyline points that happened this week in these videos, because at the end of the first Gauntlet video or the Gauntlet, um, yeah, the first double header on Tuesday, we saw. A scene with Kalinowski talking on the phone to somebody. We didn't really know what was going on. He's talking about, you know, Thad's finally standing up to him. What are we going to do? This, that, and the other. And then at the end of Friday's video, we see Kalinowski talking to a mystery person who's no longer a mystery. We know what he looks like. We've seen him before. If you remember, he, he crashed an interview at the award season last year. He was also at the live event, the last live event, and he was on stage with a corruption. So... There's, obviously, they're working together in what capacity? I am not sure. Um, Bibbs, what do you got to say about what Kalinowski is doing here? Okay, so uh, that that scene, that moment where Kalinowski was talking to someone on the phone and he realized that Kalinowski, he's not the puppet master. He's like the puppet master's yeah. puppet master. And that's a really big reveal. Uh, but the question was, and a lot of people asked when we posted an article about it, who was he talking to? And there were a lot of theories. Uh, Brian, Roca. Christian. Uh, I had a theory it was Cal the Schmo dog. I do not trust mm. that dog. Uh, I think it's only a matter of time before the dog joins the league. Uh, and I cannot wait to see how that goes. <laughs> pet division? We're going to have a pets division? No, I think I, there's, there is no <laughs> rule that says a dog can't play the Schmo down. I checked. Airbud. There Air you bud go. It. Like, yeah. just let him in. <laughs> we might need a translator, but I think that would be fair. Uh, but uh, yeah, we find out. It's this guy from, like, January. Like, the Schmodown is becoming Game of Thrones, where if you weren't paying attention in the first episode, <laughs> this huge plot point in season six means nothing to you. And it's just like, holy crap, what else have I missed? What yeah. other details are there that have been seeded throughout the game? And you just got to appreciate, like, the level of commitment to that, because uh, Christian and everyone behind the show, they have faith in the fans that we're going to watch it and we're going to appreciate it and we're going to pay attention because, yeah, every once in a while like there's going to be someone who's like, oh, yeah, who was that guy? Oh, it was that guy! Ah! Yeah. But like if you're paying attention and if you really care, uh, it's rewarding. It's really rewarding to see how this goes. And it's exciting, and I still don't know who the hell that guy is. Yeah. I mean, I know, I know he's behind the scenes, but I'm just like, but who is he? Is he going to like... Is he going to, like, buy out the Schmodown? Like, who is this guy? Like, I don't know. Yeah, he hands Kalinowski an envelope or a piece of paper and yeah. I guess his execute instructions. Orders, execute execute the... order 66. Like, what right. the hell is he going to do? Like, all, yeah. the, all the players are gone for next season. I don't know. Anything can happen. Um, and I think it's pretty clear that we're building to something. And I think we're probably going to get more as the season progresses. But, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm going to guess. I'm just going to throw it out there. And I think if you're listening to the show... There was no threat of this, but I don't think anyone's going to want to miss the Spectacular. I think the Spectacular <laughs> is going to blow some people away. I think there's so much cool stuff that is in the works. We already know some yeah. of the matches. We, we it, it, I, I cannot wait to like unleash hell yeah. on all of you. Know, like, Christian's yeah. been saying all along that... You know, everything's going to come to a conclusion as Spectacular. This is where it's all heading to. So we're going to get some answers, or almost all the answers, I would think, at Spectacular. So that's very exciting. And this, and these little two scenes, as short as they were, as small as they were, still very revealing, still very gets you intrigued as to what's going to actually happen at Spectacular. Because this is where it's all going. So uh, I look very much to the end of the year Spectacular. Chris, uh, what are your thoughts on who this, who this uh, random guy, Kalinowski, has been talking to? That he's the that he's the guy that he's the one running it all. I mean, Bibbs took my the analogy I was actually going to was Game of Thrones. It's very like this entire show is built on a lot of people. Like Christian has nailed this into our heads that it's not just the trivia; it's about everything around it and the context. The context of each match actually helps each match grow into this. This show itself is just great theater it's theater it's fantastic and this guy that um this 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 lawyer guy the guy who was on the, i was hoping that it was going to be rob burnett that would have been hilarious <laughs> of, of course you were Chris. that would have been of pretty good that would have been a really good reveal but you know what this lawyer guy i i have no idea what 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 is next i don't think you can actually predict this he is some sort of yeah, i have no idea yeah i think some it's going to be something so out of left field and yes spectacular i really cannot wait for because it's going to give us a lot of conclusions but knowing christian 
there's going to be a lot more questions as well. So I, I can't, I can't wait to see what happens with this because it's, your guess is as good as mine, Frank and Bibbs. It's just, I have no idea what's going to happen. All right. As we wrap up episode number 110, 110, uh, Bibbs, where can the good people find your work and everything you do? Okay, well, it's a lot of places, so yeah. sit down, buckle up, All get right. yourself a drink. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, I, I co-host the critically acclaimed podcast on the Schmoes No uh, iTunes feed. That's not the Collider Podcast Network, because we don't have a video component right now. Uh, but we review new movies with me and Whitney Seibold, my partner in the Schmodown, and we also, every week we do a double feature of a notoriously bad movie and a legendarily great movie. Uh, so we got that going on. We have another podcast called Cancel Too Soon, which is a separate thing. You have to find that on its own. Uh, and we review TV shows that lasted only one season or less. This whole month, we're calling it the Marvelous Month of Marvels, and we are reviewing only failed TV shows based on Marvel Comics. We just did the 1979 version of The Thing, about a teenager with magic rings that turned him into a 45-year-old cigar-chomping Brooklynite covered in rocks. Oh. And uh, this week, we're doing The Inhumans. So that should hopefully be out tomorrow. Um, and we got a bunch more cool stuff besides, and we also have a Patreon over there, patreon.com slash cancel too soon, where you can vote for future episodes, get exclusive bonus episodes. We have another bonus podcast there called Only the Best, in which we review every single, uh, best picture nominee in history in order. Uh, so that's a lot of fun as well. Uh, I, you can also find my reviews on The Wrap and IGN.com. Uh, we also have a critically acclaimed .NET website, which is slowly being built uh, uh, as we speak, and it's a hub for all of our content and also original content. And our Patreon subscribers can assign us uh, articles to write. Uh, and uh, also, you may have heard of a little site called TriviaSD.com. Uh, in which I'm the managing editor, and we have a whole bunch of Schmodown-related content there. Uh, we've got official stats, official schedules. We're going to have behind-the-scenes uh, interviews. Uh, again, we're going to have editorials written by the players. We have great uh, great contributors like Frank Janish here, uh, not just giving you the stats, giving you everything you need to understand the stats. Uh Awesome articles are already there. Speculation, top ten lists. We're we'll probably going to have some exclusive videos at some point. It's going to go cray. So uh, <laughs> by all means, check that out uh, and let us know what you think so that we can keep Real making the site better. I, I meant to ask Christian, and maybe you know the answer. Why? why how come the site wasn't called schmodown.com? Literally, know? I literally don't know the answer. Yeah, probably, yeah. Was, probably taken. You know, these probably, things. That's some true. people, some Squatters. people, yeah, yeah. Like when, uh, uh, when we started our critically acclaimed site, when we were like, what do we call ourselves? We wanted to call ourselves like a team name and we wanted it to be something that we could start branding because it'd be ours. And we had a bunch of ideas and like a lot of them were just taken, like website wise. Yeah. So critically acclaimed was the best we had. I think it's good, but like, you yeah. know, that's what we had. But yeah, I, someone may have just like, oh, Schmodown is a thing. I'll buy that website. That's me speculating. I have not talked to Christian about it. This is the website. Enjoy. <laughs> yeah. And Chris, what, what, what do you got going on? Anything um, anything cooking? Well, we just aired, a uh, bit late, but we just aired the next Schmodown trivia, Schmodown match, Master Post versus uh, Schmodown Central on Thursday. Uh, make sure to check that out. It is a match dedicated towards the trivia of the Schmodown. Next week, the 15th, we are doing, you're going to be able to see Abe Flores versus Matt Kearns. And then on the 22nd, November 22nd, Frank Janish versus Linus. Make sure to check the Schmodown trivia Schmodown out right here on Collider Podcast Network at 8 p.m. EST, premiering live. Make sure to play along in the chat. And you can also find me on Takes Me Productions, where Bibbs was just on one of our live podcasts. So just make sure to check that out. It's a fun, fun show with the guys. The guys are fantastic, and they love movies just as much as Bibbs does. They play games, and it is phenomenal. So make sure to check that out. Takes Me also does Schmodown Reactions and the Reactors Summit every Monday. So be sure to check out Take 3. You can also find me on Twitter and Instagram at Chris Clark 8788 Those numbers mean nothing. And I am, of course, Frank Jans. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at FrankieJ29. I am now also, I'm a shameless plug here, of a new podcast that I'm running. It's called Distinct Unplugged, and it comes out this 
uh, Monday the 12th, and it's it's about the tattoo industry, but it's also about the creatives in that industry, the artists, their stories, their struggles, their successes. I think it's very relatable to anybody who's a creative to hear their stories, their struggles. Uh, I'm very uh, proud to be a part of it and running it, and so if uh, it's on iTunes, you can search it, Distinct Unplugged. So go ahead and check it out. It's the first episode. So that's, like a, so that's that's a podcast about tattoo artists? It's it's with tattoo artists and it's about uh, kind of the industry, their place in the industry, uh, how they uh, have progressed with their work, their talent, um, other things that go on in the industry in terms of uh, the glamorizing of the industry through the reality shows and they get into all their, their opinions. It's really interesting stuff uh, about an industry that I really didn't know that much about but I've been working with this tattoo shop over here for about a year and I've it's it's been really uh it's really cool to get to to get to know. That's really I'm sorry I'm just gonna say this right now. That's really really cool and that's the kind of thing that interests me more than a lot of other like oh we're gonna do a podcast and we're gonna talk about bad movies or whatever. Like no I love like the the, the niche stuff that I wouldn't know yeah. otherwise and like getting to connect with people like even if it's one sided and just listening to them talk about stuff that they love that I know nothing about. Like my wife listens to like this one like YouTube show that's like this mortician talking about like death and like death care throughout the ages and which I can't remember what it was called but it's fascinating I didn't know it was fascinating but then I listened to it it's fascinating so I can't wait to listen to your podcast that's really cool yeah so it's a uh... The, the artist who's hosting it, his name is Jose Perez Jr. He's one of the top black and black and gray tattoo artists in the world, in fact. So um, really lucky to be a part of that with him and help produce it, basically. So yeah, check that out. November 12th, Distinct Unplugged. Really appreciate it. And uh, so that's enough of Shameless Plugging. Um, until then, we'll see you next week for rundown number 111. And uh, Brad, come on back, man. We miss you. We love you, Brad. Ha 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 ha.